Assistant uh, Professor Tina Widowski, and it's I'm glad to have you on today's program. And I also want to welcome my um, uh, partner uh, uh, who will be assisting with the interview. That is Dr. Samuel Duro Sharo to today's program. We are glad to have you on the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria webinar series. And it's so great for us to have you as well to be presenting the fourth virtual inaugural lecture to us. And before we start officially, we would like to interview you to know you better. And uh, I will start by asking you, uh, can you talk briefly about how you began your career in animal welfare? Yes, um, it, it was not the plan I had as a child. Um, I grew up in the city of Chicago. And so I knew nothing about farm animals. And like many people who love animals, I wanted to be a veterinarian. And so I was pursuing that, either working in a zoo or a veterinarian. And when I was an undergraduate, um, I, was, uh, I almost got into vet school. I was interviewed and they told me that I needed some livestock experience. So I began working in a laboratory in farm animal welfare with a professor at University of Illinois uh, Temple Grandin was my academic sister. We went to grad school together. I don't know if you knew that. And um, I fell in love with the field. I discovered farm animals. I discovered that I could use my passion for animal behavior and physiology to work on farm animal welfare. And so at that time, I switched uh, my entire career direction and um, have been doing that ever since. Thank you so much. So I'll ask you again, how can, I know you have worked a lot with, as a researcher and also with the industry. And in several countries, there's still this wide gap between the research and the industry. How were you, have you been able to, you know, try to solidify the relationship between these two bodies? Well, um, part of the, in Canada, there is a long history where there was a professor um, in the 1980s who established a code of practice and worked with industry in order to write codes of practice for farm animals for best practices for their care. And so at that time, researchers and scientists began working with industry partners. And um, so I've been involved in some of the policy and um, got to know people in the farms. And I was very lucky in that I always try to present at industry meetings, um, and get to know farmers. And I was very lucky in that the Ag Farmers of Canada um, appointed me a research chair. So now I work with farmers regularly. And part of it is my research, I try to make very relevant to farmers, um, talk to farmers and also bring my students with me to farms to actually see what's going on because we have ideas about animal welfare, but the practical lives of farmers are not always easy. And so you have to understand that to be able to make it work and get things adopted. Yeah, that's so, great. Yeah. So money, family, and career. <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, when I started, my husband was also a professor. He's retired now. Um, sometimes we made choices for us as a couple rather than just as individual, but also we took turns in, 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 so probably the most important thing for a career, a successful career is, is your partner. I would have to say that, right? And having a partner that you support and that supports you in your career. And um, uh, I do have some children. I did sit to take a little I worked part-time when they were little and then but I kept my hand in by teaching and doing a little bit of research so that when I got back into a faculty position um I I was able to um off what go get off and running but now that you mentioned that I want to show something off to you oh great this year <laughs> this year can you see that 
I did by some of my colleagues and they just started this program a couple of years ago um, to promote women in agriculture. Uh -huh. And so, cause I've been involved with poultry, but also with pigs. I was on the code of practice and did a lot of um, industry type of work with um, uh, swine as well before poultry. So, yeah. That's great. Uh, I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. But just one of your research findings that have been adopted commercially. <laughs> I know you may have several, but just talk about anyone. I don't know. <laughs> Probably one that has been um, adopted commercially, but also um, has made changes in guidelines is I did some work on euthanasia. Um, so on farm practices. So um, when animals on farms like piglets or poultry um, are sick and um, not recoverable, the farmers have to um, perform euthanasia to protect their welfare, to relieve suffering. And so I did um, some work using, um, looking at the different techniques that are used for euthanizing piglets and also for um, euthanizing poultry. And one of the um, devices, called a non-penetrating captive bolt, particularly for big birds like turkeys. And it um, delivers a blow to the head because there are many physical methods that you can do use and some are very effective, but they make people very uncomfortable and they're difficult to do. It's hard to kill an animal with your hands. And so we looked at these different devices. And so the Zephyr um, euthanasia device is available and has been adopted by some companies. And, and also our findings are listed in the, and have made changes in practice in the AVMA, American Veterinary Medical Association, um, euthanasia practices, and also in our codes of practice here in Canada. Well, thank you so much. Uh, oh, two questions for Professor Tina. Congratulations on the award. Uh, if I may have you, when I went through your profile, I discovered that you have worked on so many behavior in poultry. Uh, which one will you consider to be the most important one? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> Probably most important for the hen would be nesting behavior and her ability to be able to find an enclosed place to lay her egg. And so she's very motivated to do that. So some of the work that we've done is looking at um, providing a, a good nesting space. Um, and particularly what we've looked at is in enriched cages or furnished cages, how to provide a nesting space that satisfies the hen during her motivation to, to nest before laying an egg. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I uh, would love to ask this funny question. Uh, uh, you will consider that presently there is war between Russia and Ukraine. Good. Uh, what would you suggest as the best way to protect animal rights and welfare during the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine? Oh my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very, that's a different. Or maybe for any future, you know, disaster like this, what can oh, be put I in see. place uh, in case, so, yeah. Oh, so there are animals at risk because of the war. Um, one of the probably important things is we've seen many videos of people leaving, evacuating, and either leaving their animals or, or wanting to take their animals. And as a matter of fact, year, several years ago, when I was director of the Center for Animal Welfare here, we held a conference on animals in disasters and pandemics. And there we learned that the relationship between people and their animals affects the behavior of people um, sometimes to take care of themselves. And so for example, when there were hurricanes in the Southern United States, people would not leave their homes, even though it was very dangerous without taking their animals. And so we've seen videos of people in the war where people were carrying their dogs with them and haven't seen very much on the livestock, but um, realizing that um, even for comfort and upset during trauma, the relationship between animals and people are very important. And 
some accommodation so that people can bring their animals with them and continue to care for their animals is very important. Is that what you were looking for? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, this, this last question before uh, we start the meeting proper is a very personal question. I know you have published so many articles in different journals. And uh, if I may ask, uh, which journal outlet gave you the toughest time when you wanted to publish with them? Hmm. Probably the less applied journals because I do very applied work um, okay. that's very specific to. So I just had a couple papers in, in say scientific reports in there. Um, and sometimes you it, when you send to those journals, you have people um, in other disciplines that are reviewing your work, like zoologists who know birds, but they don't know poultry. And so because we, in, when we work in agriculture, we kind of have special language that we use. We have different vocabulary than the zoologists do. Sometimes that makes it more difficult, but it's a good challenge because it forces you to think about and communicate the fundamental findings that you have to the bigger picture of all birds in the world and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's probably one of the, the challenges, more challenging areas. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Yasiri, over to you. Everyone and welcome to the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. Uh, today we are having the fourth uh, virtual inaugural uh, lecture series. I am Dr. Lua Shoyasiri, the host for today and also the coordinator of the group. Doski is professor of animal biosciences <clears throat> at the University of Guelph, Univers uh, Ontario, Canada, specializing in applied animal behavior and welfare. As an animal welfare scientist, Widowski has spent over 30 years investing how, investigating how practices for swine and poultry affect their behavior and welfare. Dr. Widowski was the director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare at Guelph for 12 years. She has served on a number of scientific advisory committees including the scientific committees for Canadians, National Farm Animal Care Council for pigs and for turkeys, broilers and breeders. As chair of the scientific committee for Canada's code of practice for laying hens, she was a member of the layer code development committee, which was tasked with setting standards for the housing and care of laying hens in Canada. She also served, she also serves on the United Egg Producer Scientist Committee on Animal Welfare in the United States. Since 2011, Widowski has held the Egg Farmers of Canada, of Canada Research Chair in Poultry Welfare. Her research group focuses mainly on housing and management factors that affect the behavior, health, and welfare of growing pullets and laying hens. She and her students spent, on, spent as much time as possible working on commercial farms as well as in the lab. She has over 160 scientific publications, which is, which is excellent. So, and she just told me that she was given an award last year as one of the influential women in Canadian agriculture. So with thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shun and Sam. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's very exciting to uh, be able to share some of uh, the work we've been doing with you. Um, I thought I would talk about um, effects of early life experience on laying hands because my group and I and um, other groups around the world um, have been increasingly studying this. And um, my plan today is to cover some general concepts in it, what's early life and what things influence the animal. Um, and also the reasons why we're concerned about it, particularly in laying hands. So um, for the past you know, 50 years, 
commercial laying hens have been selected for extremely high rates of egg production. Um, they lay their, basically the commercial hen in intensive production is um, a laying, um, egg laying machine. She lays over 300 eggs um, in a year. Um, and um, the majority of her, her energy goes in, into egg laying. Um, this, these genetic changes in laying hens came at the same time as the development of conventional cages. And this led to very efficient um, intensive egg production um, so that um, eggs have, uh, of all the animal proteins, they have the smallest environmental footprint um, and what some of their most um, economical and nutritious um, egg, uh, animal proteins that there are. At the same time, these conventional cages that you see here, which are used in, in many places around the world, are um, very restrictive behaviorally for the hens. Um, they're a very small environment, barren, without many opportunities to engage in um, what their normal or natural behaviors would be. And because of that, in many places in the world, um, conventional cages have been um, either um, prohibited or are being currently phased out uh, because of market trends. And so in Europe, this happened you know, 15 years ago, almost, um, and uh, um, it's happening in the U.S. now, and in Canada, um, uh, producers are phasing out um, these systems. Um, there's an intermediate system that's been used in some places in, in um, uh, still in par parts of Europe. Um, it's not being used in the United States during their transition, but is allowed in Canada, and this is the enriched or furnished colony cage. And this cage, um, uh, this system provides an intermediate type of life um, for the laying hen, a bit more space. Um, here you can see what a, a furnished or enriched cage looks like from sort of the top open. These could vary in anywhere between 20 to 60 or more hens, and they feature per low purchase a nest area and some scratch uh, mat for, for the hens so that this is, um, allows for some uh, behavioral opportunities, but still keeps the um, efficiency and the health and hygiene of, of um, the conventional cage. Um, however, um, behavior is still limited in um, these types of systems, um, although they do work well and, and are allowed in, in some um, countries still. But more and more, Increasingly, we see the use of cage-free aviaries. And cage-free aviaries, like you see here, are multi-tier systems housing thousands and ten or tens of thousands of birds. And as you can see, it's a very complex environment that um, uh, has um, requires hens to um, uh, be quite flexible behaviorally for a number of reasons. In these systems, uh, there's a, a lot of very intense social environment. Obviously, there are thousands or tens of thousands of birds. Um, there are um, um, different tiers. So these different levels, or we call them tiers, that where food and water um, are located. There's litter at the floor or the bottom of the uh, that allows for dust bathing um, and foraging behavior. Um, there are nest boxes in different tiers. So here um, where my cursor is, those are nest boxes where the hens have to go and lay their egg. And so as you can see, this is a complex situation where hens have to be able to navigate, find their way around, uh, cope in a very intense social environment, and so this system has challenges for behavior and welfare as well, in which in order to do well in these systems, um, good health, good productivity, and good welfare in these systems requires hens to be very calm, smart, and physically fit. So here's my yoga chicken. Uh, she's very, my yoga hen, she's, she's uh, very together in terms of mind and body. And that's the sort of hen that we have to produce um, uh, or prepare for life in such a complex aviary system. And because of this, um, there was not a lot of, um, in, uh, research, early research into early life experience and the importance of it. When hens were in those conventional cages and they were just in a small box and ha didn't have a large area to um, um, move in and not much behavior, um, 
there wasn't a lot required of them behaviorally. And so not much attention was paid to her development in her early life and how that influenced her behavior and welfare. But today we know that the early experience of chicks and pullets has lifelong effects on their behavior, their health and their welfare. And so increasingly in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, we see more and more research um, that's, uh, directed or targeted at the early life of chicks and so and how it can affect them in very very many ways so we know that early life um, for any animal including chicks and laying pullets um, is a very critical period for development of so many ways that they need to function it's a period of rapid physical growth and development their skeleton and musculoskeletal systems are growing it's a time for learning and cognitive abilities to be developed. So um, they're learning about food, water, how to negotiate in an environment. They learn navigational and motor skills, how to jump, um, how to jump up on things, down from things, across from things, um, and um, how to find their way around um, uh, the various environments. They learn appropriate social behavior. Uh, social behaviors at that time. Um, it, it's a time where they might learn and recognize key external stimuli for behavior. Um, for example, um, substrate for foraging uh, rather than directing um, uh, foraging behavior at say the, the feathers of their um, group mates in terms of feather pecking. Um, it's also an important time where the birds are developing adaptive coping strategies and stress responses. And the central nervous system, as well as um, the peripheral systems that control coping and stress response are also developing at this time. And so when we talk about what constitutes an early life of a chicken, um, we can think of different stages of life. And now with so much growing research, we know that um, every stage of life, um, and it starts before animals are born or hatched, um, begins with during uh, the prenatal period or even before in the case of parents and epigenetic effects. So if we think about um, research in these areas, I'm going to kind of talk about um, for the rest of this presentation, sort of divided into these. We've got the prenatal time. So um, either uh, if in, in a mammal time in utero or um, of the chicken and the egg, uh, the perinatal stage where it's just before birth or hatching and, and immediately after, and then postnatally different stages of life as the animal grows and um, approaches sexual um, maturation. So let's start and look at um, what we know about these different periods in life and how the environment um, might influence um, development during them. So let's start in the prenatal uh, period. And so this, we're talking about um, um, uh, the life in the egg um, or, and which is actually influenced by the uh, life of the mother. So. This period actually starts with effects of environment and how the mothers are housed and handled. And so we think about the concept of fetal programming where the development of an embryo or fetus is altered because of changes in its immediate environment. And we can see this in mammals as in, inside the uterus of the mother, um, in birds, it's in the egg. And effects vary depending on what the fetus experiences. There are different critical or sensitive periods that um, shape the structure and function of the brain um, and the peripheral organ systems. And these experiences can have long-term or permanent effects on physiology, behavior, and health. And in some cases, through epigenetic effects, these effects can be carried on to and transferred to um, subsequent generations. I'm not gonna be talking about epigenetics in this um, presentation because it's um, out of uh, my area of expertise, uh, but um, it is an important and it is a mechanism because in many cases it's gene expression, changes in the DNA that causes differences in gene expression later in the life of the animal that is the mechanism responsible for this. And we know from a number of species that maternal and prenatal stress um, 
uh, can have programming effects on the stress response of, of the offspring. So the um, HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that controls the stress response um, is developing um, at this time. And there are other systems, um, for example, metabolism that there may be um, different set points during this early period of development. And we know from bear, um, humans, there's a large influence, um, interest in this in humans, um, as well as just about um, uh, every type of um, animal that has been studied, that prenatal stress or prenatal maternal stress, uh, stress experienced by the mother, in some cases also the father, can impact fetal development. And there's a lot of um, research going on in this. And part of the um, theories of why animals are so sensitive to this is the concept of predictive adaptive responses, or the idea that the prenatal environment can provide some information about what the offspring should expect in their postnatal environment. So it sort of prepares the animal to, be, to adapt to that environment. So it, for example, in a situation where there's um, food is very scarce, um, the fetus um, might be uh, prepared metabolically to better cope with short food supplies or uh, the opposite might be true and food is abundant. Or if there is a huge predation um, uh, pressure um, during the prenatal environment, the animal may be um, uh, more alert uh, take fewer risks, um, respond differently in a stressful or alert situation in order to avoid predators. So this notion is, idea is that these fetal programming and adaptive responses allows fine tuning of their biology um, so that they can cope in the world. And this, there's evidence of these long lasting prenatal effects in humans and very many animals. And so, um, so this is, um, what may also be happening in the um, laying hen. However, um, there are situations in which the environment in which animals um, develop are not necessarily the same in which the animals then are living and have to adapt to. So what generally influences the prenatal environment? We can think about it in mammals. I mean, we, it's easy to think about so mammals are in utero, so they're getting things from the mother constantly, and this can change throughout um, the entire gestation stage in, in a mammal. So the environment that the mom's in, what she's eating, um, what stressors she might experience, um, any diseases that she has, um, other factors like age or her temperament, for example. And within mammals, they can, these can change throughout pregnancy by delivering different hormones and nutrients or, or other um, uh, uh, chemo signals um, to the developing embryo and uterus. But how does this happen in birds? Um, in in egg-laying species, um, this would also be true for lizards and amphibians, um, or reptiles and amphibians, um, the experience of mothers actually can affect the composition of the egg. So her egg size and her egg weight can change depending on the situation she's in, um, the yolk to albumin ratio. Um, the mother, um, including the laying hen, puts different steroid hormones in the egg. Um, so these include corticosterone, testosterone, progesterone, and these are of interest for having effects on the developing embryo. The mom also puts in different amounts of fatty acids, proteins, um, and different nutrients. And then of course, there's the incubation conditions like the temperature and humidity, which might be controlled by the mom coming on and off of the egg, um, and also the light environment. So even though um, the embryo is in that closed little package of the egg, um, mom is, depending on her situation when she lays that egg, um, can um, uh, change the nature or the composition of the egg so that um, uh, the embryo experiences a different environment and then develops according to that. In the case of incubation, uh, we control the temperature, humidity, and light of poultry, um, and we know that also has um, uh, effects on um, development of the embryo and their health and um, well-being later on. So one of the things that's interesting with poultry, though, is the fact that 
the laying hen, we've got all the hens that lay the eggs or in the system. They're the ones that produce the eggs that um, show up in the grocery stores. Um, so the laying hens, but they're actually their moms and, and dads, but their mothers who might be experiencing maternal stress are a completely different part of the industry. They're called layer breeders and they're the parent stock of laying hens. And so layer breeders live in a completely different environment than the laying hens. This is a, a typical layer breeder um, situation in many places where there's roosters and hens, okay, because uh, they have to produce fertile eggs that become the, the laying hen. And so this environment might be very, very different from their daughters who end up being the laying hens who are housed, say, in a conventional cage or an aviary. And there, there really hasn't been very much um, uh, research um, overall um, in parental flocks, um, very little research actually, and to look at um, how do we treat, if how we house our parental flocks, um, any handling, any stressors, how does that affect our laying hands? And there's actually very little in, uh, research into that. But when you think about it, it's pretty darn important because every layer breeder hen, so these are the mothers, produces about 125 to 150 laying hens over her lifetime. She's kept in production for um, about a year. Um, so she's producing 300 eggs. Half of those eggs will be males. Half of those eggs will be females and end up being um, laying hens. So really there's only a few parent flocks that produce all the commercial layers. And so this is an example from the United States, for example, where there's around 375 million commercial laying hens, but those, their moms, they only come from 3 million layer breeders, which is a big number, but it's very small. So it means that how we impact the mother can have significant impacts on a lot of um, their um, laying hens. And we know from um, a variety of studies, and there's just as a few of them, that experiences of the hen can affect um, uh, her offspring. So that in terms of maternal stress, mothers subjected to stress, and we just talked about that, how um, stress, the offspring are um, setting up the, the HPA axis is being developed at that time, um, receptor systems for glucocorticoid feedback within the system are developing at that time. And so mothers subjected to stress directly transfer hormones and other elements to the embryo. And this has been studied either by directly stressing the hen and looking at the effects on her offspring or by injecting hormones into the eggs and seeing what those hormones, um, what effects they have on the offspring. So we're concerned about what's happening to the mom but we're measuring about what, ha what happens to her offspring. And we know that from a variety of studies that um, stressing mom or um, ex exposing her to, to different stressors, different environments of um, different treatments can affect the physical development of the offspring, uh, the behavior of their offspring, particularly when it um, comes to fearfulness and anxiety. Um, and uh, emotional reactivity, we would call it, um, but also stress response. And there's a number of studies, and some of them are quite different in that um, baseline cortisol or corticosterone might be changed in some cases, depending on what the stressor is, it might be increased or decreased, and HPA access response can be changed. Um, it's still early days in understanding exactly um, how it would work, but the thing to keep in mind is that how we treat these mothers can impact the behavior and welfare of their daughters, the laying hens. Recently, um, we've just done some work on the effect of um, maternal stressors in, in um, uh, uh, laying hens, but also what I want to talk about now is the effect of maternal age, because we found some very interesting um, results. Um, and we in several flocks, in two, two consecutive flocks, large numbers of animals, we inseminated commercial hens at um, three different ages. And these were hens that were living in different environments as well, but I'm concentrating on the age of the mother because this is one of the strongest effects that we've seen. And so you can find this um, published in a couple of our, our recent papers. 
And when we come to breeder flocks, um, breeder flocks, as I said, are kept for about a year. So they come into, so these are the mothers of the laying hen and they come into lay in 20, 20 to 22 weeks of age, approximately, or 18 to 22, somewhere around there. And so a flock, a breeder flock is considered quite young when they're say 25 to 27 weeks of age. That's when we inseminated them. Um, the breeder companies consider the ideal age for breeders to be when they're in, somewhere in 40 weeks of age. And that's because the size of the chick is good, the fertility is good, the hatchability is good and so on. So that's considered a good age. And then older hens are those that are nearing the end of the flock cycle. And so we had hens um, that, were, that we inseminated to collect their young. Um, uh, we collected their fertile eggs, um, hatched them out and reared them all together. Um, so, so that we could compare the offspring of young ideal and old hens. And then we measured growth, behavior, and stress response of their offspring. And just for a short summary, we found some very interesting results that um, could explain why we have some flock-to-flock -flock differences in laying hens. Um, we found that old hens laid heavier eggs. We know that as a hen gets older and bigger, her eggs get bigger and the chicks hatch at a bigger hatching weight. But at the same time, there were differences in the yolk to albumin ratio. There was less yolk testosterone as the hens got older. And we know from studies in other species that yolk testosterone has um, a number of behavioral effects on the developing embryo. And we also saw that those offspring grew at a slower rate. We subjected um, the offspring to the social isolation test so that when they were little chicks, they're put in a, um, they're separated from their conspecifics, um, put in a box by themselves, and those chicks engage in distress calls, which is considered a, um, a measure of anxiety. And so we found that the, um, during this social isolation test, um, the offspring from old hens produce fewer distress vocalizations than the offspring from young hens. So they seemed calmer or less fearful. We also subjected those, their chicks to a novel object test. So offspring from the old hens approach the novel object faster than those from the young hens. So as I said, they, they were, seemed to be less fearful, less anxious. And when they were subjected to a manual restraint test, so this is blood sampling here, but it's a restraint test in which the bird is held down for five minutes and the amount of struggling is counted um, in that bird. And then immediately afterward, a blood sample is collected and uh, corticosterone measured as measured, um, plasma is collected for corticosterone measures um, to, to measure HPA activation, we saw differences between the offspring from different ages of mothers. Um, and so while those, um, the, this is the plasma court, they had a much higher court um, uh, uh, level after the restraint test, but also during the test, those offspring of older mothers struggled more. So we could, could be interpreted that they were more stressed, although in these other tests, they seem more fearful or that they had a more active or, or, or a different type of reactive or proactive stress response in which they were struggled more and had a um, higher stress response. So we don't know at this stage how to predict what this means for the adult laying hen, but we do know that the age of the mom has some pretty significant effects on their, on their offspring. And so this might explain why some farmers get in flocks of laying hens. They, ma they uh, manage them the exact same way, same house, feed them the same way, but flock to flock, you get some pretty large differences. And perhaps it's the age of the flock. And I'm hoping that in the future, people will pay more attention to the flo flock age because it can significantly affect some of these measures that we do. Another effect during the prenatal stages um, or from the maternal stage is that uh, is the area of maternal nutrition. And it would make sense. Obviously, farmers try to feed very healthy diets to their breeder hens so that they produce um, healthy offspring. 
but there's a possibility that certain nutrients might also influence behavior um, of, of offspring. And this is my student, Rosie Whittle. Um, you may have met her. She presented to this group last year. She's still working on her PhD. Um, and she's looking, this is in collaboration with a nutritionist. So he's interested in feeding omega-3 fatty acids. So like flax oils and the, the fatty acids from fish that we know have a lot of health benefits for humans, for children. Um, uh, but also they're looking at the health benefits on the breeder hens. Um, uh, so the nutritionist wants to impart better health and productivity to the breeders but also see what the effects are in their offspring. But there are some um, indications from the literature that there may be some cognitive effects because fatty acids are what make up the brain during development. And there is some um, evidence from the literature that fatty acids also it, um, actually increase fearfulness um, in offspring from mothers fed fatty acids. So Rosie's doing a, um, a whole series of tests where mothers were fed um, omega-3s, um, looking at tests for cognition and fearfulness. She's also measured brain. She's still in her analyzing and writing up phase, but I can tell you so far that she has found that feeding omega-3s to moms ends up um, with a higher brain to uh, body weight ratio. Okay, and those omegas um, fatty acids are showing up in the brain. So far, the tests for learning and cognition have shown no difference, but, but there's some indication uh, with uh, at least uh, with broiler chickens, uh, maybe with laying hens, that there might be an influence on fearfulness. So stay tuned for that, but this is another possibility for how that early environment could affect the bird. Hatching, so let's move on. So that's in the egg, what we do to the mom, uh, what we do to the mom changes the composition of the egg. So what's the next stage in development? And that's hatching. And we know that both for broilers, chickens, but also for laying hens, that um, many, many hens, millions and billions of chickens around the world are hatched in commercial hatcheries where there are tens of thousands of eggs that hatch at the same time on the same day. And the hatching um, is the, the chick hatches out of the egg itself, but then it is handled and processed and it goes down conveyor belts and is um, in the case of a laying hen that chick might be sexed uh, to determine if it's a female to be kept for production. Those chicks are maybe handled for vaccination or for beak treatment. And so uh, not in my lab, but in um, some other labs, there's a much an increase in um, um, uh, interest in what is that hatching stress in early life? That's a very critical period in the development of the chick. Um, and so this is in uh, Perry, Perry Jensen's um, in, in Sweden. He's been doing quite a lot of work in this area, looking at how this effect um, and this commercial hatching process and all the stressors that the chicks go through at the time uh, might be affecting um, their long-term um, stress response, things like their pecking behavior, negative uh, cognitive judgment bias, so their moods later on. And so this is early days in this research, but it's proving that they're, they're, uh, we may have to pay more attention to how we handle those early chicks in the early days. So that we've Got, looked at the prenatal stage. There's that short period around hatching, but a lot of work now is going into the effect of rearing. And this is one area that I am uh, love to talk about because we've been doing quite a bit of work in this area. And it's just amazing how you, what differences you can make in the body and behavior of an animal um, by rearing it um, in an enriched environment. Makes sense, but it's quite interesting to see. And so in the past, um, not a lot of work went into the rearing environment and laying hens. Again, birds were going into mostly in conventional cages where 
behavior didn't have to be flexible because there wasn't anything to do. And so in those situations, uh, most of historically and today, many, many chicks and pullets um, destined for conventional cages or for um, other types of housing systems are typically reared in conventional rearing cages. So these are small barren cages. Here on the left, you can see this is what it looks like when they're first hatched. They put paper on the floor so that they can um, find the food. Um, they're kept warm, um, fed. Uh, this is this pipe right here is actually a nipple drinker. It's not a perch. It gets raised up in the cage as the birds grow so they can reach the nipple drinker. And so basically they really don't have much in terms of enrichment and they grow up in this cage. And on the right, you see, this is the same set of birds in the same cage, but when they're older. And so there's not a lot of um, space. Um, there's no opportunity for jumping or flying or running or um, flapping the their wings or perching. And so, um, so this is um, a very restrictive environment for these hens to grow up in. And when aviary systems and non-cage systems were first being developed for in Europe, when the change from conventional cage was going over, it became pretty clear pretty fast, um, at least in practical situations, that rearing in a barren cage does not fare, um, fare well for a bird that's going into a complex housing system. And we know from research and from practical application that hens housed in complex areas must also be reared in complex environments. And um, uh, research, um, a lot of early research out of, uh, out of um, Norway, um, Andrew Jensik's lab, um, showed that rearing in aviaries enhances the spatial cognitive abilities of birds, um, uh, improves their three-dimensional use of space, their ability to jump around, and also reduces fearfulness, so how they use their space, um, uh, and also how they respond to things in their environment. And this is pretty important because in those aviaries, um, as I said, you need to have a calm bird because a bird that responds fearfully, um, they could, there can be a panic where birds will get piled and smothered, which is a, a welfare problem. Uh, but fearfulness might also be related to aspects of behavior problems like feather pecking. So now um, a number of people around the world are looking at how this early rearing and uh, uh, makes a difference in terms of different aspects of um, the behavioral biology, but also the physical conditions of laying hands. We know that um, during these periods and that animals are set up for, um, uh, their brains are very plastic. So in the, the early parts of development, the neonatal and juvenile stages, the developing brain is very sensitive to experience. So what the animal sees, smells, hears, um, as, um, the sensory environment, its motor experience has an effect on um, the development of the, the um, nerve cells, neurons in the central nervous system, and particularly parts of the brain um, that are involved in um, uh, uh, navigation or spatial cognition. Um, and there are sensitive periods in which the developmental stage, which the nervous system is, ex has, is especially sensitive to experience, and so um, it's important for animals to, to experience or see or hear or be able to do certain motor patterns during that time to help the uh, brain develop. But also there's, we know that there's critical periods where there's a window of development where the animal has to be exposed to certain visual stimuli, for example, um, or um, uh, motor patterns to do, um, or they will never, um, pick it up for the rest of their life very well. You'll have abnormal development and irreversible changes. And this is true for the social environment to some degree as well. We know that puppies and kittens have to be exposed to both other dogs or cats and people during this critical period or sensitive periods early on or later in life, they will never adapt as well to being with people or be able to breed with other dogs. So uh, we know that uh, we have to identify this. Are there sensitive periods in the Langhen, for example, in which she has to experience certain things? 
early days and research for that. We do know that learning to purge or learning for three-dimensional space is important. Um, and there seems to be a sensitive or critical period for that. Um, and so um, early work by Gunnarsson in Sweden showed that if birds and, and other work as well, if, if chicks are reared without perches or the ability to, to jump up on three-dimensional things um, during the first, say, eight weeks of age, they will have difficulty learning to do that. I um, mean, some of this was first discovered with um, broiler breeders where in the breeding hens, they had to be able to jump up to get to their nest boxes to lay their eggs. And if birds were reared without any sort of purchase or navigation, they would lay all their eggs on the floor because they didn't figure out how to go up. And so we know that um, this is very important and it is obvious for a long time when birds are reared in conventional cages and you put them in a three-dimensional space, they just don't go up. Um, and we know perch use gradually increases from one to 18 weeks um, and they seek higher perches as they get older. But this, there seems to be a sensitive period for learning this three-dimensional space. And uh, we're working more on this um, to see um, how this works. In addition to, um, say, stress response, fear, um, cognitive abilities, uh, be able to find their way around, a musculoskeletal development is also really affected during the, the growing period um, and pre-puberty. And this is uh, based on the um, mechanical loading theory or the mechanostat theory. And that bone is um, bone is pretty dynamic and bone, the shape of it, the way it grows, um, responds to mechanical forces. So mechanical loading, um, there are sensory cells, um, osteocytes that actually um, sense mechanical loading so that when you move, if there's loading, it strains, a muscle is pulling on a bone or gravity is pushing on a bone, the cells in that bone sense this. And so, um, so that there's actually like a sensory perception within bone, um, which um, activates osteoblasts, which are the bone builders, and osteoclasts, which are the um, uh, cells which um, uh, remove um, bone tissue or mineral tissue from the bone, so that these cells are activated and respond to this mechanical loading. And so that um, uh, in some cases, there's resorption and modeling so that during growth, the shape of the bone is actually changed because of the experience with the musculoskeletal loading. And so bone tissue senses strain from external forces and activates those osteoblasts to actually change how the bone is formed. And it's pretty fascinating and amazing the differences that you could see depending on how um, an animal is reared and what kind of exercise that it does. And this is true, it's been shown in humans as well, um, uh, ballet dancers or uh, somebody who grows up ballet dancing or playing tennis will have a different skeletal structure than someone who doesn't. And so exercise increases the bone mineral density and can change the shape and the structure of the bone. And we're learning more and more. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on this in my lab um, at how um, early experience and how the exercise um, uh, affects um, the laying hen. And this is really important for laying hens because osteoporosis is a problem in the laying hen. Remember, they've been selected to produce all of these eggs, three, over 300 and some odd eggs in a year. Every single egg takes about two to two and a half grams of calcium. Where does that calcium come from in the shell? And so um, uh, laying hens have three kinds of bone. We only have two. We have cortical bone, which is on the outside of the, so this is a long bone. So the cortical bone is the outside structural bone of it. We have what's called trabecular bone and those are struts inside that give it strength. But also um, laying hens have a specialized type, all birds do actually called medullary bone, which is a storage, um, uh, a storage uh, type of bone, storage tissue for calcium. And so um, when, 
hens reach sexual maturity, their osteoblasts, so those are the bone building osteocytes, switch from developing structural bone. So as the laying hen is growing up, she puts on cortical bone and trabecular bone. And then as soon as she hits sexual maturity and estrogen goes up, she starts putting on this medullary bone. And here is, um, a, this is a, a, a micro um, CT of uh, bone. So this would be, at, my numbers have disappeared. This is what bone would look like at 16 weeks of age. So a young pullet who's entering lay. This is a hen who's just, who's in peak lay. And this is an end of lay hen. And here you can see on the outside, I hope you guys can see my cursor. On the outside, there's some a thick wall of structural bone there. But later on, what happens is she's putting her osteoblasts are putting on medullary bone, but all types of bone are being taken away. So by the time she reaches, she's an old lady and reaches this, um, uh, like at the end of laying, her bones are very structurally fragile. It's mostly medullary bone and very little cortical bone is um, left. And so we're finding out that in the laying hen, but it's true for humans as well, that um, osteoporosis is being viewed more and more as a pediatric disease and how you build your bones as a kid and before puberty has huge effects on your, osteo your skeletal integrity later on in your life, regardless of whether you exercise later on. And so this is osteoporosis is a problem in hens because it also relates to keel bone damage. So here is the here's the, my friend, uh, the skeleton of a, a hen. This is her keel bone. And uh, the keel bone is the flight where the pectoral muscles for wing flapping and flight connect to. And we know now that particularly in non-cage systems where hens might fall. So there's all those perches, they can crash into things and fall. Um, there's a high prevalence of keel bone fractures. There's also keel bone. So this is the side of the bone that you can see. And these are all little fractures on these dissected bones. Also, this is the back side of the bone. We see fractures there as well. We know that these are painful and limit mobility. Some of them occur during falls and collisions. And so um, there's a lot of research going on to figure out how do we prevent this? How do we strengthen hen's bones? And so one series of experiments that we did a few years ago was to look at exercise in early life. And basically we reared pullets in conventional rearing cages. This is our um, conventional rearing cages, like the one that I showed you before, where the hands are, they're put in there as chicks. And these are young pullets. You can see they're just getting their combs and they grow up in these cages and they have very little opportunity for exercise. They don't even really have the room to flap their wings. So they're mostly just standing all the time. And we also reared birds in um, this, this is a rearing aviary where um, in this so here the chicks are put in at the central section of the aviary and as they grow up platforms are raised and they have different tiers they can go on and purchase and so in here they can run and jump and fly these tiers are opened up later in life and then there's litter here so these are two different there's a long shot of the aviary and a sideways shot and so you can see here birds have opportunity to fly and jump and do all kinds of load bearing exercises as they grow up. And if you're interested, we published a few papers out of this. It was my PhD student, Teresa Casey Trot, a few years ago. Um, and uh, she looked at um, what uh, looked at the musculoskeletal characteristics of the pullets raised in these. Um, after they were taken out of the aviaries, they were all put in furnished cages, so they had the same amount of exercise both birds from conventional, birds from aviaries, they're all put then in furnished cages and then watched um, with measurements being taken of their bones and their keels until they were 72 years of age. And what we found were there's profound and lifelong differences on their skeletons. Pullets reared in aviaries have larger keels. Their keels grow bigger um, because there is, they get to fly and the muscle is pushing on this keel and um, it grows differently and, and slow, more slowly with different amounts of cartilage. They have heavier pectoral muscles. So as you might, the flight muscles, um, stronger bones. And 
bigger cortical density. And that cortical area that I showed you, this lasts until they're 72 weeks of age. Even though they're taken out of an aviary and put into a furnished cage, that difference stays for their whole life. And we also found that hens reared in aviaries had fewer keel fractures when they were in those furnished cages. Is it because they were better navigating and had less collisions in there? Or were they stronger keels? We don't know. So we're looking into that now. So now um, the last bit of research that um, I'll talk about is that some of the ongoing work that we have now is the question. So let's see, I showed you these different. So this is one type of rearing aviary that's open concept. And the birds have all the room in the world to run around and fly and jump from the time they're little bitty chicks. But not all rearing aviaries, aviaries are actually designed like that. There's different types of commercial rearing aviaries that are on the market that confine the birds to different amounts of space for the first four to six weeks of age. And so um, I'll tell you what, what, what these are like. So right now we've um, compared some in commercial. We've got a field study where we looked at commercial conditions. And also we have these different types of aviaries um, at our research station that we've been using to study. And so um, uh, what I'm calling rearing style, aviary style one, and a number of companies that are out there that build commercial aviaries um, have style ones. And a number of companies um, produce each. So these are sort of the general trends and how rearing aviaries work. And what I call style one, these are usually several tiers of basically closed cages or what they look like. Okay. And so the chicks, whoops, sorry, the chicks are placed in these compartments. There's low. So this is, it's bigger than the conventional cage I showed you, but not much. And there's a couple of low perches in here. And so the birds are pretty much have they're confined to this air, like this area when they're little. And then at say six weeks of age, um, that the sides of this are opened up and then they're let out to a litter area and, and other perches. Okay. But the first six weeks are pretty confined, almost like a conventional cage. Then there are other aviaries that um, are also have the birds confined, but that brooding cage where they're confined, that brooding compartment has more vertical space and is more complex. Whoops, sorry about that. I keep changing these. Uh-oh, there we go, sorry. Um, so this has a platform, it's got low perches and high perches. And so here the birds have more three-dimensional space. So they can jump up and down and they have, um, um, so that during that first six weeks, they are kind of learning to perch um, more higher up, learning to go from one level to the next. And then like the other one, this is opened up um, to allow full act, um, access to, to, to the litter and other perches. Um, and then finally, uh, there's what I call the aviary style three. These are less common, but they are commercially available and farmers are less comfortable with them because they like to have those little chicks in a small space where they can watch them really well when they're little. But in this type of aviary, it's a big open concept. So this is the one at our research station, but um, so, so it's smaller in a, in a commercial situation, it would be as long as a barn and the chicks have um, free space to run. They have little perches to jump. And then these perches are, um, so this is the one that I showed you before. Um, the platforms are raised, the terraces are opened up. So this is the, um, uh, when, they're, when these terraces are open, then the birds get access to the litter, uh, but which they didn't have when they were inside. But as you can see, the opportunities for load bearing exercise is really different during that first six weeks. And then we've also compared to the old conventional rearing cage. Um, and so now what we're asking is, does that first six weeks of experience make a difference? And so you've probably, you've seen on a wrench before, she has um, presented to this group last year, I think, um, and she's concentrating on the effects of rearing style. She's looking at cognitive cognitive and navigational ability and fearfulness. Um, she's looking at measuring the differences in the actual different types of load bearing exercise that the birds do in the brooding period. And then later on when they're let out, 
Uh, she's doing series of behavioral tests for fearfulness um, and for ability to learn maze learning, um, ability to jump up um, in complex um, uh, from one uh, level to another. And then she's also following um, some hen soule to measure um, uh, behavior and keel status. I know I'm at 15 minutes. I will be done in a moment. Um, and so um, she's in the process of um, doing finalizing, analyzing her data and uh, uh, writing up now. Uh, but for some, uh, just a little bit of preliminary, um, for an example of some of her, her um, research, looking at is there a difference with those different rearing aviaries? Um, she subjected um, some of the birds, so they were reared in these different systems at 14 weeks of age. She took them out, put them in a, um, a tea maze in which they had to uh, learn to associate um, either a side also and a color uh, with um, a food reward and a reward for escape. Uh, we did this with both brown and white birds and their motivation for stuff is very different. So to get it to work, um, they were offered this um, and then they had to um, learn, they were, um, habituated to it, they were shown uh, what the correct choice was to escape or find food. And then uh, they had um, a series of learning or, or test trials um, in which they had to have 80% criteria, get four right out of five. Um, and here, this is a, um, um, a survivorship curve where this is the number of trials it took for birds to reach their criteria. And here is the conventionals on the bottom, style conventionals. And here are, so you can see styles one, two, and three. And aviary three uh, were faster than conventional cages and aviary two were faster than conventional cages. I'm not sure if there are actually any differences between style, stay posted for that later. Um, and finally, uh, I, um, I had a student, Aaron Ross, who concentrated on musculoskeletal characteristics. Um, so she took birds out at six weeks of age, right at the brooding compartment, um, at 11 weeks of age, and then 14. Um, we dissected out um, uh, bones, muscles, tested bone breaking strength, um, looked at keel size. Um, and we also sent bones over to some collaborators at McGill University, their biomedical researchers who specialize in bone, doing a series of measurements. And so um, the highlights of this, once again, aviary birds had larger keels. Uh, birds in uh, system two, surprisingly, had different shaped bones at six weeks of age. Those birds also do more jumping and flying um, um, during the first six weeks, which is interesting. And so we're, um, as we um, analyze this data, we'll be able to correspond some of the differences we see in load bearing with um, these differences in the shape and the size of the bone. But again, it's amazing. The bones grow completely different shapes. Well, not completely, but different lengths, different widths, if depending on the type of exercise the hens do. So I'll end here. So my summary and conclusions, I hope um, um, you've learned something a little bit about early life and hens and chicks and how um, early experience is very important and can have profound changes that affect skeletal health, uh, behavior, stress response, and that early experience begins with mom. And we need to look more into that. At each stage of development, the environment can have profound effects. And the amount of research in this is, is growing and is absolutely fascinating. But the concerns for how we rear our animals um, and how we prepare the laying hen is that stressful conditions at any of these stages can affect the behavior and um, uh, stress response of the laying hen. Um, there may be problems if we have mismatched rearing environments with adult housing systems. We know that. But what about mismatch housing systems for the mothers with the daughters. And um, so that bearing rear environments are not good for the overall development of the chick. And also um, there may be critical and sensitive periods for socialization, <coughs> but also other aspects of bone development and behavior um, that we still need to, to address. Thank you very much for listening and I will stop sharing and take questions.
thank you so much, uh, Professor Tina, with this key. This is, I've already told uh, uh, the participant that it's going to be knowledge packed uh, session. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> to be sincere, you know, I'm so amazed at the way at which you did your presentation. There was no stop, no hitch, nothing. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we have loads of questions here. So probably I need to prepare the mind of everybody that because we need her to address all these questions, we may, you know, exceed the time a little bit. We have loads of questions, and this is an opportunity for us, you know, to have our questions answered because we, we, we never can say when next we'll be able to grab you. So <laughs> I, I hope um, you don't mind if we exceed the That's time right. just for some because we have loads of questions. So I will yep. start with uh, a question from. Uh, Dr. Samuel Durosharo, he want, he's asking, uh, do you support uh, embryonic thermal manipulation for beds to withstand heat stress later in life? Do I support it? What do you think about it? Does it uh, have a, a, an aftermath effect on the cheeks later in life? From what I know, um, it... <laughs> I, I, I'm not an expert, this is done in broiler chicks. It might be done, I don't know if it's done in layering hens at all. I don't think anyone has actually looked at that. Um, if there are beneficial in hot environments, if there are beneficial effects with, I don't know if there are any long-term negative effects, but if we, I've talked about the bad parts of fetal programming. I haven't talked about potentially the good aspects of it. If we can figure out how to program the birds, like by um, subjecting them to a higher temperature to actually do better later on in their life, um, that would be, I'm, I would be very supportive of that. Can, uh, it would be good, to, we need to prevent um, negative aspects of fetal programming and promote positive aspects of it at the same time, I think. Yeah, I think uh, probably we need to find a balance um, yep. Yeah. So I have this question. There is this long debate on the issue of uh, chronic stress in laying beds. <laughs> how far have we gone on this? And how can we also be, uh, find the balance between uh, uh, that uh, chronic uh, feed restriction in the performance of the laying beds and also their welfare? Chronic feed restriction. Okay. So feed restriction is not done in the laying hens. So the breeders that I, were I was talking about are the layer breeders. And so the broiler industry and the layer industry are completely different birds selected for different things. Okay. okay. In the layer industry, those birds are fed ad libitum. They don't have problems with growing too fast. Their energy is put into eggs. Okay. The broilers have been selected for huge appetites and fast growth. Those you, you have to feed restrict the parents because otherwise they gain too much weight, they don't reproduce, they have very poor health. That's a problem. That's a big problem and a consequence of selection for high productivity. So in the laying hens, it's not an issue. In broiler breeders, it is an issue. Um, some of it would be genetic selection for slower growth and less appetite. I think we fixed that a bit. We've, that is a consequence of genetic selection. Those animals are not healthy because we've selected them for high productivity. We may have to use genetic selection to fix that problem. Okay, thank you. So we, we can use genetic selection to address some problem and we can also use it to fix some problems. So uh, what, is, what, <laughs> what is your opinion <laughs> on the issue of uh, the killing of the old male chicks, especially, I think it's more relevant to the laying, the, the laying hen, the males, I'm, which are not, you know, important. Uh, they tend yeah. to kill them a day old. So what do you think about this? Um, I think it is unfortunate. Many people consider it unethical. It's a waste of very many healthy birds. Because of the selection for meat versus eggs, and people have tried with dual purpose, there's no use for those males. So the best solution is to learn is to develop ways to sex those eggs before the embryo develops. 
and a lot of people are working. Okay, so the, in terms of the destruction of those males, it's an ethics problem. Is it a welfare problem? Well, you're depriving the animal of those lives, but they're not suffering. And the methods that they use in the hatcheries are not pretty, but they are macerated. But and with knowing from my work in euthanasia, they're gone like that. So questions. <laughs> so are there known disadvantages of environmental enrichment in poultry production? I think one of your students or you had one of this um, research that you did and you had um, uh, 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 that uh, environmental enrichment actually reduced uh, play behavior in the chickens, right? Oh, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, that is a difficult one to explain. I don't in this, okay. With that, the problem is using play behavior and spontaneous and, and um, we did a, a test for play behavior. God, you guys did your homework, didn't you? Um, in, uh, <laughs> she presented it at the conference in Norway, yeah. I think oh yeah, 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 Jen, Jen did, okay. Okay, so we had broilers. These were fast growing broiler chickens. Some had enrichment and some didn't. And we used um, uh, worm running and also a free space test to stimulate play behavior. And play behavior was higher in the unenriched birds than in the enriched. And part of the explanation for that is that the birds in the unenriched environment had less stimulation so that it was perhaps easier, much easier to actually get them excited in playing by putting a stimulus or making a change in their environment because their environment was barren and unchanging that when there was a change, it tended to stimulate play behavior more. So I don't think that you can say that the environmental enrichment was detrimental I would suggest that you have to be really careful with how you interpret play behavior okay. as a test for welfare, okay. because the level of arousal and stimulation of the animal, if you are very bored, you might be what to play some, play a boring game, right? <laughs> that you wouldn't, if you're like not bored, you might not play it as, right? So it's sort of where the level of stimulation was where they started off. So, um, uh, so it's how to, so it's, we always have to be very, very careful with all the tests that we use for assessing welfare and how we interpret them and looking at, um, so yeah. So I don't, I would, I, most, most research would say enrichment is positive. I don't think that that would suggest that enrichment was negative just that play behavior in that test may have not been an appropriate one. Okay, thank you. So uh, what is the possibility of assessing uh, the affective state in chickens using facial expression? Do you think it's possible because we have like different uh, facial scoring skills that have been developed for the older farm animal species. Do you think there is the possibility of having such for chickens? <laughs> interesting yeah uh maybe okay uh no one has tried that i'm familiar with the facials because i've been on committees with uh, someone who has been doing it in monkeys and they've done it in pigs and i know with all of the the facial action units that are used in pain faces usually involve um the cheeks and lips right? They're, usually they're sort of cheeks are puffed out. That's true for horses, rodents, and monkeys. Um, chickens don't have cheeks or lips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that won't be true. The other facial action unit that's used is their eyes. Mm -hmm. So usually their eyes drawn like, a, like the monkeys do a frown, uh, the rodents and the pigs do a squinty. And if you think about chickens, when chickens aren't feeling well, sometimes they do that squinty checkout, 
So maybe we could use their eye positions, but the other facial action units, they don't have those facial parts to do unless they do something with opening or closing their beak to a different degree. But un until we actually try and study that, that's a very interesting concept. Yeah. Yeah. chickens are so hard though you know they're you, when you they look sick they're pretty much almost dead right they're so good at hiding it it's, it's subtle illness is so difficult to 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 get in the chicken so yeah. anyway good question thank you so much uh the question keeps rolling in uh what is your view on the use of corticosterone as a measure of stress do you think it is the best measure of stress i hate it <laughs> Um, I think it depends on what type of stressor you are trying to measure. If you are looking at an acute stressor, so for example, when people use cortisol or corticosterone in looking at does dehorning hurt a cow and does an analgesic and an anesthetic help that if there's an, or a, a frightening situation in, in terms of an acute stressor. I think it's useful in terms of a chronic stressor. Um, it's not because there are too many changes. There's that really nice paper by Alan Tilbrook a couple of years ago, in I think Journal of Animal Science. He's a stress physiologist in Australia. And he talked about all the different things that you need to think about. Um, I, I don't use it very often unless we are looking at stress reactivity and subjecting an animal to an acute stressor and seeing how much they respond. I, I rarely use stress response in any of my comparisons of housing systems and things. I rarely use it because I, I find that they're very often very difficult to interpret, particularly in a chronic situation. Yeah, because I think there is also this argument that uh, the corticosterone measurement uh, does not actually tell you about the, uh, the valence, whether it is positive or negative, but it only gives you an, uh, an information on the arousal. So That's whether it. it's a positive arousal, you know, sexual uh, experience mating or positive thing, it could still trigger corticosterone. So you can't right. actually use it as a, a measure of... Uh, Feelings. Right. That's why that's why only in situations where you know it's going to be bad, like pain. Right. So, so you, you can in situations where you're testing something that you can confidently predict the valence, like pain or a fear or something like that, then I then it's useful. But you're right. Just by saying um, so, for example, you take a dog to a dog show and you say, are dogs who go to dog shows? stressed or not they could be excited to be yeah. going yeah. and court goes up or they could be terrified to be going and court goes up yeah. you have no way in that case you don't know how to interpret the valence yeah. right yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you so uh there is this saying that if the foundation is destroyed what can the righteous do i don't know if you've heard that but uh, there is a question if the foundation is destroyed what can alone I don't uh, understand that. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear. I don't know what foundation. Uh, I'm still going to the question. I'm just trying oh, to okay. prepare your mind that if the yeah. foundation of something is destroyed, what can be done about it? And the question is, if uh, the welfare of uh, the chickens at the early life ha have been compromised, is there anything that can be done to correct this? so that they would not develop uh, issues later in life. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess it depends on what it is. So for example, if the animal has never learned to jump or our, like our, it's really interesting when we test those birds out of conventional cages versus aviaries and on a rent, she was blind to treatment and so there were birds, groups of birds in these different pens that had come out of those rearing systems. And you could tell, you could tell who was out of conventional because they weren't going up and using their perches. I think that if you know that they lack something in the rearing that is important for them, 
you need to accommodate their adult life. Um, livestock, it might be hard. Um, so in that case, you never take a bird out of a conventional cage and try and put her in an aviary. So that would be one thing, just like don't accommodate the adult. And I think, I guess another example would be like with dogs or cats and socialization. If a dog hasn't missed the period of socialization with other dogs, don't expect them to interact with other dogs later on. So accommodate their environment knowing that they've had some sort of detrimental experience early on. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think lab-grown meat is a solution to some of these animal poultry welfare issues? Or animal uh, welfare issues? Uh, well, it eliminates the use of animals. By eliminating the use of animals, and um, um, I mean, then there are, there will not be some welfare, you know, <laughs> eliminating the use of animals eliminates their welfare issues. But I think not everyone is a proponent of that. And there are ways to improve welfare, hopefully, um, so that people who make the choice to still use animals can do so in a way that, that protects their welfare. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Not everybody too can be a vegetarian. So and that doesn't solve the welfare issues. So we still need to look at means of addressing the problem. So there is a question here. Besides exercising, is there room for improving pullet feed nutrient levels to boost uh, structural bone formation? You know, you talked about the kill fracture bone. Yep, yep. Um, actually, Elijah Carey, when our nutritionist here is um, doing work on that um, and um, looking at feeding different particle sizes, we actually, environment, it's interesting because he was feeding different calcium particle sizes to pullets at different ages and chicks. And there may be something to do with that because how long, calcium stays in the digestive tract and those sorts of things um, can make a difference. So proper feeding can help, but it's not the whole solution because in terms of osteoporosis, people have used nutrition. Again, there's a, an, another area where genetics is going to make a difference. So people are selecting for stronger bones. Um, so like many of the welfare problems have been created by selection for productivity at the expense of other aspects of the animal's biology. And in that case, um, we can support them with feed, but there's no way you can get enough calcium into, you can help it, but there's no way you can get, uh, get enough calcium. I think she can only, the Langhan can only absorb, I don't know, 40% or something of what she needs. There's you can't feed them out of osteoporosis at this point. Selection for stronger bones would probably be better. Um, and a lot of the, the breeding companies are using that right now. So selection for bones and keels is being integrated into a lot of genetics companies, um, particularly now that they're trying to select for the 500 egg hen, if, if, you, if you heard of that, where hens will keep, keep laying for, an extended period. Um, and they know that to, for that to work and to not impact welfare negatively, that there has to be selection for bone strength and bone integrity also has to be integrated into those selection schemes. And there are a number of papers on that by geneticists and from companies. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, like the aviary system that you showed us, we could see that uh, the, the number of animals, you know, they, in terms of population, there is likely to be um, contamination of the food, of their feed. And uh, do you think there was going to be an increase in a transfer, uh, disease transfer, trans, uh, transfer in that kind of system? Um, contamination of feed is less so than 
the, the litter on the floor. That litter on the floor is that they dust bathe in and they forage in in those aviaries and they eat is mostly excrement. It's not, they put a, a, only a little bit of bedding and then the litter builds up and that litter, it's mostly dried feces or excrement. And so um, if there's an increase in disease, um, if you look at the literature that compares cage systems with non-cage systems, disease is definitely a bigger challenge in the non-cage systems because in the other systems, the birds have separated from their manure. And so that helped with a lot of um, health aspects and coccidiosis and things like that. And I think there are definitely more challenges in non-cage systems. But there are ways to, you know, um, perhaps vaccinate and control and those sorts of things. But disease is definitely a bigger challenge. Birds are in, exposed to and ingesting feces. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they just keep picking on things, you know. And um, there is uh, somebody, uh, one of the participants is talking about a case study where he, ha he or she, I don't know, have noticed that uh, a, a, a hen was unable to stand or walk immediately after laying in a conventional cage system. And uh, what do you think could be responsible for this? And um, have, you, have you had any such experience? Unable to stand or walk. Or walk after immediately, laying. Immediately after laying an egg. Did she recover later on? Oh, well, uh, yeah. He, he didn't put in the question whether that right. happened, but he just because wanted to know what could be responsible and how can the handler help the hen. No, what I know about this is that uh, the, the hen, <coughs> the, I know of the depleter system, they still take few, a few seconds to roughly one minute after laying, you know, maybe to regain strength, I probably check, you know, the egg that has just been laid. Some would like to sit on the egg, you know, just to, you know, enjoy, you know, the success of laying this before leaving the next box and then continue with its activity. Probably that is what he or she is talking about, but I, I have no idea. So even in the, even in a conventional cage, the hen will go through um, like a phantom, like a vacuum nesting behavior. So she will, uh, get a be kind of searching for a nest as little as she can mm -hmm. and be more agitated in that and then she will lay her egg and she may be go into actually sitting behavior so the phases of pre-laying behavior she goes through searching and then she goes through yeah. sitting yeah and she's gonna do that in a cage so yeah. what you're like what you are saying she, Sean she's that she might be just still in her sitting phase of egg laying if it was a Dutch, if it was a detrimental condition, I would think that potentially, you know, hens get hypocalcemia. Mm. If they're, they are at such a high level of egg production, a commercial laying hen that if she is say, say a feeder goes empty or she misses feed for a day or something like that, um, her calcium, um, status and balance is so it kind of marginal because she's putting out so much that birds if they don't if they are off feed for a day they can go into hypocalcemia which the low calcium because calcium is a, a um, involved in neuromuscular uh, transmission uh, they'll go par they'll be paralyzed from hypocalcium hypocalcemia mm -hmm. so um, so so but that's not specifically associated with the time of egg laying, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, wow, I don't know how to cope with this. The questions just keep coming in. <laughs> oh, I know. Do you still have time, Tina? Yeah, a couple more minutes. All right, because I know it's very early for you in the morning. Um, sorry for waking you up. It's 9.30, but I never had breakfast. So. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I did not get a that's not good for your welfare, you know that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, there's a question here. 
Are there any observations or studies to measure stress-related behavior in chickens? I don't understand. It's not clear uh, either, but uh, observations or studies that can uh, talk about or that have talked about stress-related behavior in chickens. That's not clear. Stress-related behavior. Yeah. When birds are stressed, what do they do? It depends on the type of stress. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, stress, various stressors are known to um, contribute to the development of feather pecking. Um, and laying hands in. Yes, yeah. I do know that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of if you're talking about stress, is it thermal stress? That uh, if an animal is under heat stress, then they use thermoregulatory behaviors. If an animal is uh, under social stress, they might be aggressive. I think it really just depends on, like, like what you said, it depends on what the stressor is um, and how they respond. Are there general stress behaviors? Uh, I don't know. Somebody can help me out if you can think of one. I think the question is not really clear, but I know there are studies that have talked about the behavior of uh, the behavior of uh, chickens, you know, exposed to different types of stressors. So I want to say it depends on the type of stressor is actually talking about. So I think we need to move on. Uh, can you can you please briefly explain on the changes of brain development if if uh, the bird is reared in uh, a barren environment, do you think it will affect uh, the brain development of the chick? Okay. Um, I have not done, I'm not a neuroscientist. I have not gone into the brain and done those measurements myself. Um, I know that people do study certain areas of the brain that have either um, more neurons, more dendritic branching, um, different areas that are involved with uh, control, for example, spatial navigation and those sorts of things. Um, you'd have to check the literature for that, um, right? So I, I know people look at hippocampus. Mm -hmm. I would have to check with the neuroscientist for that. I actually tried... I offered my brains, not my brains, but my chicken brains. Chicken brains. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, someone take our brains because we've reared these so many birds in all these different environments, but uh, no one had the, the funding or um, um, to do that. So um, I don't know. I can't answer that. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. One or two more than will end. Do you think do you think there's a possibility of in over injection of calcium carbonate as a means of reducing kill bone damage in hens? I have no idea what that would do to the developing embryo. I Maybe don't know. just to um, as a means of uh, you know increasing the level of calcium. Um, right from you know cheek level, and yeah, see whether know. they will end up developing kill bone uh, fractures later. Yeah, in. I don't know. Um, I think the, the embryo uses some of the calcium carbonate off the eggshell. I think um, I I do not know the answer to that question, and I have no idea what effect it would have on the embryo. Thank Sorry. you so much. So <laughs> with this, we come to the end of the Q&A session. So, but we still have a few minutes to be with you. Uh, the participants can please turn on their videos. If you have other comments, you can signify by the raise of hand. But I want to appreciate all the, uh, the, the Nigerian group, the uh, participants. But I also want to appreciate all 
you know, participants from other parts of the world that joined this meeting. So Tina, you'll be surprised that your, your former PhD student, uh, Erasmus Marisa, is part of us today. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, please turn hey, on your faith video, please. Out there we'll too. Be happy to see you. So Marisa is part of <laughs> us today. And uh, we have Rebecca Notquist from the I Netherlands. She joined today's meeting. We also have uh, Sabah. Sabah, just wave your hand where you are. He's joining from Sudan. And um, we have Lucas. Hey. Lucas is from Cyprus, but he's joining from the UK. Please, you can just wave your hand, Lucas. And we have uh, uh, Surya. Surya is joined from Malaysia. She's the one that asks about uh, uh, brain changes when the chick is, uh, she, because she does a lot of work about, uh, you know, changes in the brain due to his stress. And uh, we have uh, Novelota. You want my brain, Saria? Sorry? Saria, do you want my brains? No, she doesn't <laughs> want your brain. She wants the, the chicken brains. Maybe she can work with. That's uh, what I need. <laughs> with you and get some chicken brains to work with. She needs uh, some work to do. <laughs> so we have a uh, Novelota Pizza from Brazil, and we have. Um, a whole lot of Nigerian participants. I would like to acknowledge them. So please, if you want to say something to her presenter today, kindly indicate by raising up your hand so I can unmute you and you can do that. We just have a few minutes to do that. She, she's yet to have breakfast, but at least I want to believe you're enjoying the session with us. <laughs> I am, this is great. So, Aki Yemi Rukayat, please uh, unmute yourself and talk. Aki Yemi Rukoyat. I can't find. Hello? Yes, That's... we can hear you. Yes. Well done, well done Ma, for the insightful presentation. Uh, uh, we are really grateful, Ma. Please, I asked a question. I, I don't know. Uh, it, it was not answered. The question goes to us that uh, since the boards to be read in the in the aviaries are usually calm boards, they are physically fit and um, Okay, physically fit, calm, and one other trait. So my question is that: Does it imply that those boards must have been selected for such traits? Must it only be boards that have been selected for such traits? Huh? That's an interesting question because um, no, we've probably been by selecting birds in the situations that we have. We've probably allowed a lot of less smart birds to stay in the population. Um, if you know what I mean, we've relaxed pre selection pressure through artificial selection. There's no been selection for, for smart birds. Um, but what, what that leads me into is, we've been doing a lot of work between brown and white, different strains of birds. So um, I, I, the, I caught and went through a lot of this stuff very quickly. Um, in, in this, in our aviary, the aviary, um, study that we have going on we're comparing browns and whites and browns brown birds do not want to go up they're not motivated by the same things they do more poorly in most of our learning tests because they can't um but there are certainly better adapted strains than others and at least in north america people like brown eggs coming out of non-cage systems because they think the brown egg is more natural or I don't know why, but um, white birds do a lot better in these systems actually because they are built to go up, uh, they're built to fly. One of the things that I didn't tell you about in this, when we compare the keels and the musculoskeletal structures between browns and whites, they're also really, really different. And the, and the locomotory and load bearing behavior that the birds do in these systems it's completely different between strains. And so I think we can do a better job of matching strain both cognitively and physically to the different systems and maybe selecting for that. I know um, I visited a genetics company one of their a number of years ago where they had their research station and they were selecting for behavioral traits as well as um, egg laying traits. So they had little transponders on the birds um, so they could track their nesting behavior. They could track them going out of pot, pop holes to go to the outdoors. 
um, and they also were tracking their egg production traits. So um, more and more behavioral traits are being, and, and um, uh, behavior that, um, you know, non-feather pecking, uh, birds that are less apt to feather peck are also. So, so there's a lot of behavioral traits that are, that are coming into play because they're more important right now. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank so you. Uh, yeah, it's gonna, it takes both, I think. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yep. Thank you so much. Is there anybody that wants to give a comment before we end this session? I also want to recognize uh, Tumishe Fate is here, Ilias Belo, um, Abdullahi Erena Abubaka, Mariam Loguleko Fumelola Oyebanji, thank you for joining. Adeo Ye Samson, Olubo Di Kola De Olide, Benjamin Onyesom. Adekulesho Runke, thank you for joining. Peter Dele Aliyu Ab Abdul Jalal, Brian, Brianica, Akinju Femi, Oba Femi, Lucille, Demontia, Zeno Bennett, okay. Um, uh, just a minute, uh, Novel Pisa, Bukola, Maja Kodumi, uh, Lucas, just to appreciate our participants, uh, and uh, Victor Yenera and um, Valentine Obiasugu, Ahmed Abdul Rahman. All of you, I want to appreciate you for joining us. Oluwato Ezekiel Tomori Abayami. So, Tsumishi, uh, yeah, please unmute yourself. Please unmute, yeah. 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 Um, this is more of an appreciation to um, Professor Tina and the uh, Manufacturing Group Nigeria. Professor Tina, thank you so much. We are talking a lot on how the management of, of animals, of birds, particularly, how it can um, affect their, their birds' health, their fear, and their behavior throughout their whole life. So, Really appreciate you taking out of your busy schedule to, to really talk to us today. We have really important answers to all our questions. But in your time, so thank you so much. Thank you. And my welfare group, thank you again, Professor Tina. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah, we need to appreciate Professor Tina because her students too, she tries to encourage her students to present on our group. I think two or three of them have presented on our group and I yes. want to appreciate you for that. Uh, yes. Professor Rebecca, do you want to say something before we end? Rebecca, not please. Do I? Okay. I can unmute you. Please unmute and just say one or two things. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for participating because I know you've also presented on our group and I want to believe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, this has been an amazing series. That's uh, uh, very much thank you for organizing all of this and getting all of these scientists from different places presenting. And uh, I always enjoy very much the questions. And thank you, Tina, for the presentation. It was wonderful. I uh, caught up a lot on uh, on some of the research that's uh, that you've been uh, doing. And this was a good afternoon. Great. Thank you all. Great. So thank Thanks you so much. Uh, it's, um, I don't know if Marisa wants to say something. Is she still with us? Um, Marisa, are you there? Marisa, are you with us? Trying to look out for her. I'm not sure. I don't see her on there anymore. I'm Maybe. not sure she's here anymore. Yeah. So once again, on behalf of the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria, I want to say a big thank you to Professor Tina Widowski for accepting our invitation to present. And it was a very you know, knowledge packed presentation. And I want to believe we've all had one or two things to learn and to take home. It's, it's a whole lot for me because you know, I'm also into poultry, uh, poultry welfare. So thank you very much. And uh, with this, I say bye-bye. Uh, and we meet next time. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Thanks. everybody, and Thanks. have a lovely day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.